Good, mor good morning. Please pardon uh, the delay. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Carrion. I'm the chair of the Oversight Board. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the uh, 16th meeting of the Financial Oversight Board, uh, Management Board for Puerto Rico. Uh, I'd like to ask, as is customary, that uh, all attendants please cooperate in conducting a uh, productive meeting, uh, including keeping cell phones uh, in silent mode and abstaining from conversation and comments. Um, I'd like to, uh, before we begin, recognize the presence of uh, the, uh, C the, uh, the CFO of the Government of Puerto Rico, uh, Secretary Raul Maldonado, este, and his uh, staff. Welcome. I'd like to uh, determine uh, a roll call, determine quorum. Uh, Dr. Biggs. Here. Uh, Mr. Garcia, who is joining us by phone. Present. Uh, Judge Gonzalez. Present. Uh, Mr. Jose Ramon Gonzalez. Present. Uh, Professor Skeel. I am present. Uh, and uh, the ex officio member, uh, uh, representative <clears throat> and uh, head of AFAF, uh, Mr. Sobrino. Here. Uh, I, there is a quorum present, uh, which um, that is, uh, there's a quorum present. Um, and then we now would like to call this meeting to order. I would like to ask. Uh, Mr. Alcuri, uh, our general counsel, the board's general counsel, to act as secretary for this meeting. Yes. I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, all of you in attendance and also everyone that is watching uh, the live stream uh, of the meeting via the board's uh, website uh, at uh, www.oversightboard.pr.gov. I am pleased to say that the audio, uh, as is customary, of this meeting via the webcast is available in English and simultaneously in Spanish. Um, if you log in to the English website, the audio will be in English. If you do so uh, in Spanish, you will hear the translation. Let's move on to today's uh, topics um, as part of our agenda. Uh, number one, the approval of the uh, October 23rd uh, public meetings and the 328 public hearing meetings. Uh, we'll move on to administrative matters. Then we'll have a, a brief report by the Special Claims Committee uh, a report by our executive director, uh, followed by remarks on proposed revisions to the certified fiscal plan for the Commonwealth, uh, board discussion on the proposed revisions to the certified uh, Commonwealth plan, and public comment on the proposed uh, revisions of said uh, plan, uh, discussions on certification of revised Commonwealth plan, and presentation, lastly, presentation of proposed designation of municipalities as covered territorial instrumentalities and fiscal plan and budget submissions by the Centro de Recaudación de Ingresos Municipales, known as CRIM in Spanish, and certain other municipalities. Let's move on to the uh, proposed agenda. Uh, agenda minutes. The, the, our first order uh, of business Mr. is Mr. Chairman, if I may, please. Yes, of course, Mr. Uh, Secretary. I would like to read a brief statement from the office of the CFO, if I... Not yet. Hmm? I think the agenda is... We, 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 we will... In, we will Later we, on? Yes, you will have your opportunity to, to say you, as well. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Um, a, our first order of business is to approve the minutes of the board's last public meeting held on October 23rd, 2018, and the minutes of the board's public hearing on the Department of Public Safety Executive Session held on March 28th. The proposed minutes are included in your uh, uh, meeting materials. Um, does anybody have any questions about these meetings, uh, minutes? There being no questions, I would like to ask for a motion to approve uh, the minutes. I'll make that motion. Uh, I'd like to move to approve the minutes of the board's public meeting held on October 23, 2018 and the board's public meeting held on March 28, 2019, in the form presented to uh, the meeting today. Would anybody like to second that motion? I'll second that motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask for a voice vote. Uh, those in favor, please say yes. 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 Uh, there being uh, all members having voted in favor of the motion, the minutes are approved. Uh, second item administrative uh, matters. Uh, now I'd like to recognize member uh, Jose Ramon Gonzalez. I'd like to make the following motion, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, be it resolved that the board confirms and approves the unanimous written consent adopted by the board since the adjournment of the board's last public meeting, 
which are listed in Appendix C here, too. Uh, I'd like to second the motion. I'd like to ask for a voice vote. Uh, those in favor uh, say yes. 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 Um, all members having vo Everybody in favor? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Everybody uh, having, all members having voted in favor of the motion, the resolution is approved um, and has passed unanimously. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make the following motion. Between the adjournment to this meeting and the opening of the board's next public meeting, the board may consider an executive session any and all matters that it is authorized to consider under PROMESA, including one, any certification determinations authorized by PROMESA, including certification determinations under section 206 of PROMESA, two, any submissions or authorizations authorized by PROMESA, and three, any filings authorized under Title III of PROMESA in each case that are set forth as part of the vote to convene such executive session. The board may also act by unanimous written consent between meetings in accordance with the bylaws with such consent to include consent by email. Mr. Chairman, I will second that motion. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Now I'd like to ask for a voice vote. Those in favor, please say yes. 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 Yep. All members having voted in favor of the motion, the resolution is approved. Um, now we shall move on uh, to a report by the Special Claims Committee. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Judge Gonzalez, as a member of the Board Special Committee, to summarize uh, and remark on recent actions uh, by uh, the committee. Judge? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what I'd like to begin with is, is the, uh, what we were faced with in this regard. We were faced with a deadline of, I believe it was May 5th, 2019, two years after the filing of the Title III proceeding. Under Title III, certain sections of the bankruptcy code were incorporated in, into it. And as a result, uh, we were able to utilize those sections to look back at a period of time to see if transactions with the Commonwealth, specifically and then with the other Title III debtors as well, warrant being uh, avoided, meaning payments or transfers of value were made to parties, and the question would be under bankruptcy law, should those transfers be avoided and monies paid back or other, otherwise value returned to the estate? Those actions were uh, in, looked into, investigated, et cetera, by both the Unsecured Creditors Committee as well as uh, the Special Committee, the Special Claims Committee. And that process began in earnest in, a, in late 2018, approximately five months before the deadline. The actions fit into three main categories. Number one is actions that could be brought regarding the interest and principal paid on the 2012-2014 bonds, which were objected to by both the committee and the special uh, unsecured creditors committee as well as the special claims committee, were objected to for being believed to be invalid as a re result of the constitutional limitations on debt. Now, what I think needs to be made especially clear here, the ability to claw back interest and, and principal payments is 100% contingent upon the bonds themselves being found to be invalid. If a court does not find that the bonds are invalid, then there can be no clawback of the interest in principle. And what we did is just try to preserve the possibility to claw back the interest in principle in the event that the bonds are found to be invalid. Now with that, we are cognizant that many, there are many small holders of the bonds, and this would be a great hardship if after years, having, uh, years ago having received the interest and principal, even if the bonds were found to be invalid, that that would be clawed back or brought back into the estate. So we made it as clear as we could that even if the bonds were found to be invalid, 
we would not pursue any recovery of interest or principal unless the holder had more than two and a half million dollars worth of bonds. So if you hold less than two and a half million dollars worth of bonds, there is no intention of trying to get that interest and principal back that has already been paid, even in the event of the disallowance of the bonds. So we wanted to put people at ease, at least with respect to this notion of trying to get the interest and principal back. We are not going to do it, even if the bonds are found to be invalid, as long as you don't hold more than two and a half million dollars worth of bonds. The second group, I'll call a category of actions that were brought, were actions we had advised the court we were going to bring actions against the institutions and professionals involved in <clears throat> the bond issuances that were objected to. We either entered into total, well, we advised the court that we were going to commence these actions against the various parties or get tolling agreements. And just for a moment, I think it's appropriate to express what a, what a tolling agreement is. We were faced with a deadline in early May to file these actions. We asked the party to agree that that deadline would not apply to you. We would not sue you, and we would continue a dialogue, discussion, investigation, et cetera. But if we were faced without an agreement that we had more time, which would be the tolling agreement, we were faced with no other choice but to commence the action. The third category, I think, is going to take the most time to explain, and is, for many of you, maybe the most, the one that you're most concerned about. And that's what we'll, I'll call, for sake of ease, the vendor actions. As I said earlier, under the bankruptcy code, those sections that were incorporated into PROMESA, we could look at payments made within specific periods of time to determine whether or not <clears throat> those payments should be brought back into the estate. Now, the period of time at issue is a, generally speaking, is in, a, in accordance with either the bankruptcy code or under local law. Now, here local law is the law of Puerto Rico, and under the law of Puerto Rico, certain causes of action can be looked at with a four-year window looking back. So what we did was, <clears throat> in conjunction with the Creditors Committee, with data and being provided terms in, in terms of the names of the vendors, et cetera, the addresses at times that we didn't have the address, from a FAF, we spent this time analyzing the various transactions that occurred with payments from the government under contracts. Now, I, I, I specify that it's under contracts because we're not talking about legislative appropriations, we're talking about contracts. And we did that for this four-year period of time. Those kinds of actions fit into two categories. One is called a preference. The preference period is 90 days for non-insiders, so let's just focus on the 90 days. And what that means is within a 90-day period, if you receive the payment from the, com from the Commonwealth under a contract, and that payment was a somewhat, I'll call it for, for the sake of ease, a catch-up payment, meaning that you owed money, the monies were due and owing, they were passed due, et cetera. If you received that kind of payment under the bankruptcy code, it would be called a preference, meaning that you receive payment of a past due amount within a specific period of time. We looked at those payments. The larger category of payments we looked at <clears throat> were the payments made under a sections of the bankruptcy code called fraudulent conveyance. They don't specific, specifically involve any improper conduct, but what they involve is looking at transactions to find out if the debtor, and here it's the Commonwealth and the other Title III cases, should have properly paid this amount. 
whether services performed, et cetera, was too much money paid, or procedural requirements to payments uh, followed, et cetera. We looked at that. And to give you an idea of what the scope is of that, the scope involved 1.2 million individual payments paid to 141,000 vendors with a total dollar amount of $11.8 billion. What we did was we pared that amount down through various filters. One filter was we were not going to look at <clears throat> governmental transfers, so we eliminated those. Another filter was, and a, and a huge filter, was that the amount at issue during that four-year period had to be in excess of $2.5 million. We also <clears throat> struck out, in terms of considering not-for-profit entities, including charitable foundations, et cetera. When we were through with the analysis, going through all those filters, we ended up with 320 vendors with a total dollar amount of approximately $4 billion at issue. With respect to those 320 vendors, we sought tolling agreements, as I described earlier what the tolling agreement would do. We sought tolling agreements such that we wouldn't have to file the suits to claw back the funds within, a, within the time frame that we were faced with. We received 85 tolling agreements executed. We were then left with having to file 235 actions. And those actions, uh, I will find the page at one point with how much money is at stake in that, but it, it's a couple of billion dollars. And let me spend a little bit of time of explaining how those determinations were made. Under Puerto Rico law, contractors with the government must have their contracts registered in the, go in the government managed or administered database. It's our understanding of Puerto Rico law that if a contract is not registered, the contract vendor should not be paid. So we looked at whether or not there was a corresponding contract for the various payments. We looked at whether or not the contract, even if it were there on file, whether that contract amount indicated was less than the amount paid. So we took issue with those, contract, those vendors that were paid. Either there wasn't a contract on file <coughs> or the contract on file did not correspond to the payment itself. And as a result of that, we filed these actions attempting to claw back the amount. Now, we are fully aware that some of the lack of the contract being on file in a database, et cetera, may be explained. So I think we can look at it from the standpoint now of next steps. What are we going to do? We are going to work with the committee and develop a process as lower cost process as we can to avoid, uh, to avail parties so they can avail themselves of an opportunity to, to provide documentation, to correct us if we're wrong and they, these contracts are actually in the database correct any other mistakes that we may, we may have made or provide for an explanation as to why they're not in the database. But I think the database issue needs to be, at least from my standpoint, highlighted. The reason that there is a government requirement for the database and the contract to be on file is to provide, in large part, transparency for regarding those parties who contract with the government. And as I said earlier, it's my understanding that payment shouldn't be made unless the contract is in the database 
and the payment should not be in excess of what the contract provides that it's related to. I think as we step back from this and we, we can focus on two things. Number one, vendors I think have to be diligent, extra diligent in making sure their contracts are properly reflected in this database. And number two, those parties responsible for making payments on behalf of the government, I think to have to as well, continue and, and to ensure that they're paying vendors who are pro properly registered. So that's where we are now. And I, I think from the vendor standpoint, <clears throat> we are gonna develop this process. The information will be sent out to all the vendors who were an action was filed against them or has filed a to tolling agreement. And we will try as best as we can to have a streamlined process. Ultimately, uh, there may be a number of these that cannot be resolved through that process and may have to go to litigation, but we are going to do everything we can to resolve this in an efficient, effective manner and <clears throat> as soon as we can. I would think it would take probably a month trying to work out a process uh, to enable to do this, and we will use that as time period as diligently as it can to accomplish that. And I think that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Judge Gonzalez. Um, for members of the press, there'll be uh, a uh, detail provided and questions in Spanish at the, uh, at the end of the conference. Um, now let's move on to the report by the executive director. Um, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Esco to provide a brief update of the oversight board's activities since our last public board meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In October of 2018, the board certified a Commonwealth fiscal plan that incorporated material new information, including, among other things, actual revenues and expenditures from fiscal year 18, additional federal disaster-related appropriations, adjustments in demographic projections, implementation progress on structural reforms, and the COFINA debt restructuring settlement. In January, as a direct action following the release of the independent investigation of Puerto Rico's debt, the Oversight Board's Special Claims Committee filed an objection in court contesting the validity of more than $6 billion in general obligation bonds. In February of 2019, the Title III Court approved the COFINA Plan of Adjustment, which is the first entity to exit the Title III process. Working together with the government, we restructured COFINA's $18 billion debt reducing the par amount of COFINA bonds by $6 billion and reducing total debt service by 32%, saving the Commonwealth approximately $17.5 billion. On an annual basis, the settlement will reduce the maximum annual debt service from $1.85 billion annually to $992 million and allow the government to spend the difference on general expenses. This plan of adjustment helps avoid additional costly and time-consuming litigation, enables local retail bondholders in Puerto Rico to receive a significant recovery, and provided flexibility to the Commonwealth in managing future debt refinancing while avoiding the liquidity-based borrowings that contributed to the current crisis. In March of this year, in response to much public concern regarding the state of the Department of Public Safety and its funding, and in light of the need for greater transparency, we began a series of public hearings on the status of implementation of the fiscal plan. And the first was on the Department of Public Safety, which was very helpful <coughs> to bring much needed clarity as to the status and the needs of the different bureaus. Also in March, we released our bank balance report prepared by an independent forensic analysis team of Duff and Phelps, detailing the investigation into the liquidity of the government of Puerto Rico to assess the sources and uses of public funds and legal restrictions on these funds to protect the ability of the government to provide public services to the people of Puerto Rico. As of June 2018, the report determined that the entities and instrumentalities covered in the report hold 1,159 accounts with a total value of about $10.2 billion. We continue our work on the investigation to determine restrictions on those resources and the necessary working capital of the government entities and instrumentalities, as well as updating the date of record for those balances. Throughout the last months, we continue to perform oversight of government fiscal activities, 
budget approvals, reporting, and status of implementation of key structural and fiscal reforms. In some areas, such as the PREPA privatization, we see much and encouraging progress with world-class proponent participating in the transmission and distribution concession process. In other areas, namely fiscal, we've called for some corrective action upon receipt of the Commonwealth's budget to actual reports. For example, we've requested information pursuant to PROMESA Section 203, given overspending at the Office of Human Resources Administration Office. Moreover, we have called for immediate action before the end of the fiscal year, given the government's failure to collect funds from several entities that are not remitting the employee contributions to the defined contribution plans. This practice is simply unacceptable. Equally as important, we have insisted on the importance of the government's completion of the much-delayed comprehensive financial statements. We welcome this week's presentation of the fiscal year 2016 audit and hope the government will ensure fiscal years 2017 and 2018 are finalized and that best practices are in place to achieve the complete fiscal year 2019 audit. In terms of the board's operations, we are hard at work augmenting our internal capabilities to the oversight board staff. In the last few months, we've increased our staff to over 25 staff members and will continue to hire personnel in key areas related to fiscal plan implementation, monitoring, and reporting. As part of our work, I testified in Congress on behalf of the Oversight Board <coughs> to provide an update to the U.S. House of Representatives Natural Resource Committee on the status of PROMESA three years after its signing into law. And last week, we announced a definitive restructuring support agreement with PREPA ad hoc creditors and bond insurer which reduces PREPA's debt by over 30% and protects consumers from uncapped debt-related charges. This agreement is an essential step toward ex executing the transformation and modernization of Puerto Rico's energy system. Relative to the prior restructuring support agreement, which the board rejected in 2017, the current agreement would save PREPA and, the Puerto, and Puerto Rico's residents who depend on its electricity supply about $3 billion in debt service payments over the next 10 years alone. The agreement includes a fixed transition charge as a measure for protecting PREPA's customers from potentially larger rate increases in the future based on a lower demand forecast. As part of the fiscal year 2020 budget process, we have engaged in a collaborative process with the government to develop a revised fiscal plan which reflects the most up-to-date information available and which will inform the fiscal year 2020 budget. We'll discuss this revision in more detail later today. And lastly, we are hard at work to present a Commonwealth Plan of Adjustment as soon as feasibly possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Resco. Uh, now let's move on uh, to, uh, and uh, I would like to recognize uh, the CFO of the Governor of Puerto Rico, Mr. Raul Maldonado, who I'm told will make certain remarks on, uh, regarding uh, the government's fiscal plan. And, and the uh, that was certified on October 23rd. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, we prepare a statement, Chairman, uh, in English and in Spanish. If I may, uh, I would like to read it in Spanish, so for the benefit of the press and the benefit of the people of Puerto Rico. Buenos días, señor presidente y miembros de la Junta de Supervisión Fiscal de Puerto Rico. Comparezco como principal oficial de finanzas públicas del debidamente elegido gobierno de Puerto Rico para presentar nuestro plan fiscal revisado. Como en ocasiones anteriores, el gobierno ha invertido mucho trabajo y esfuerzo en este plan fiscal, lo cual creemos continúa estableciendo una base sólida sobre la cual se pueden realizar las esperanzas, los sueños y las aspiraciones de la gente de Puerto Rico. Como todos saben, la Junta certificó su plan fiscal el 23 de octubre del 2008. El gobierno inmediatamente tomó medidas para poner en práctica este plan fiscal realizando su proyección de ingresos, buscando lograr reajustes de presupuesto y ajustándose a las medidas nuevas y expectativas de reformas, mientras que a la misma vez se comenzó con los preparativos para el proceso de presupuesto del año fiscal 2020. Apenas tres meses después, la Junta exigió al gobierno que actualizara el plan fiscal, mientras continuaba apoyando un proceso presupuestario mucho más intenso y además con un calendario reducido. Se otorgó al gobierno menos de dos meses para presentar dos borradores del plan fiscal y un presupuesto preliminar para el año fiscal 2020 con un nivel mayor de justificaciones y detalles nunca antes visto. A pesar del tiempo limitado y el inmenso esfuerzo requerido, el gobierno presentó un plan fiscal que reflejaba la mejor información disponible en ese momento y las prioridades y políticas actuales del gobierno. Antes de presentar el plan fiscal revisado del gobierno, me gustaría resaltar algunos de los logros claves 
desde que se certificó el plan fiscal de octubre de 2018. Se implementó una reforma contributiva. La reforma se basa en un modelo de ingresos neutrales que brinda un alivio significativo a individuos y empresas y ayuda a impulsar el desarrollo económico. Se implementó la reforma de crédito por trabajo. El EITC es un beneficio para las personas que trabajan y que tienen ingresos bajos o moderados. El programa ayudará a aumentar significativamente la participación formal en la fuerza laboral, ofreciendo un retorno de inversión positivo. Esta es una iniciativa crítica, ya que no somos un Estado y, por lo tanto, no tenemos acceso al programa federal EITC. Se formalizó la Oficina del Principal Oficial de Finanzas Públicas de Puerto Rico, lo cual se una función financiera del Gobierno de Puerto Rico y brinda controles mayores, más transparencia e informes. Se reestructuraron 17 mil millones de deuda existente de COFINA, lo cual ha brindado al Gobierno Central acceso a miles de millones de dólares e ingresos futuros durante los próximos 40 años. Este dinero se utilizará para alinear nuestras finanzas y cuidar a nuestros residentes más vulnerables. Se publicaron los estados financieros auditados del Estado Libre Asociado del 2016. Se implementó un nuevo proceso de presupuesto basado en políticas que brindan un presupuesto multianual, una mayor transparencia y las herramientas para evaluar mejor el impacto de las políticas e informar la toma de decisiones. Se implementaron reformas en el cuidado de la salud y la educación para garantizar que continúe brindando a nuestros ciudadanos servicios de educación y salud de alta calidad que a la vez sean rentables. A estos logros se le añade el trabajo de reestructuración y eficiencia operacional de las agencias que hemos realizado hasta la fecha. Esto ha resultado en una reducción de más de 20.000 empleados sin despidos, el 20% de nuestras agencias y el 17% de nuestros gastos de presupuesto operacional. Presentación del plan de gobierno. La presentación del plan fiscal revisado del gobierno es bastante consistente con el plan certificado del 23 de octubre de 2018. Desde una base fundamentalmente macroeconómica y fiscal, el gobierno actualizó el plan con la mejor información disponible. Sin embargo, no, no tuvo el beneficio de poder incluir la actividad de ingresos de presupuesto en curso para el año fiscal 2020. El gobierno ha estado trabajando en colaboración con la Junta para poder explicar esta información. Me gustaría resaltar varias diferencias clave en cuanto a políticas y supuestos del plan fiscal del 23-10-18. Reforma de las pensiones. La Junta sigue insistiendo en una reducción de los beneficios de pensión en todos los sistemas de retiro de gobierno. El gobierno se opone a estas medidas adicionales de reducción de pensiones porque imponen una carga desproporcionada a los trabajadores y pensionados de Puerto Rico. Implementar cualquier reforma de pensiones en el plan propuesto requeriría apoyo legislativo y ejecutivo y puedo asegurarle a la Junta que no recibiría apoyo en esa área. Financiamiento de Medicaid y reforma de la salud. El gobierno debe preservar y mejorar su sistema de salud mientras logra asegurar el apoyo federal necesario para su población de Medicaid. Las medidas de reducción de costos propuestos por la Junta no son realistas y resultarían en el colapso del sistema de salud de Puerto Rico. El gobierno incluyó fondos federales adicionales porque eso es lo que se necesita para asegurar el nivel de apoyo y servicios requeridos por la población más necesitada de Puerto Rico. Medidas. Muchas de las medidas son consistentes con el plan fiscal certificado del 23 de octubre de 2018, pero como las medidas están en proceso de implementación, el gobierno tiene una mejor visión de los costos de la misma y del plazo de implementación que se reflejan en el documento sometido de parte del gobierno. Financiamiento federal para la recuperación de desastres. En función del lento ritmo de financiamiento hasta la fecha, y los mensajes inconsistentes recibidos por parte del gobierno federal. Intentamos ser un poco más conservadores en torno al momento y la cantidad total de fondos federales en el plan. La Junta insiste en que las medidas de nuestro plan fiscal no son suficientes, pero el gobierno simplemente no puede imponer más medidas de autoridad, como los recortes de pensiones que afectan a los segmentos más vulnerables de la sociedad de Puerto Rico y revertir los beneficios de los empleados. Algunas de las medidas recomendadas por la Junta, en nuestra opinión, solo profundizarían el sufrimiento de la gente y extenderán la crisis fiscal y económica de Puerto Rico. Hoy la Junta votará sobre la certificación del plan fiscal. Esta votación afectará el bienestar y el futuro de más de 3 millones de ciudadanos estadounidenses que residen en esta isla. Les insto a que no solo consideren las medidas propuestas por el gobierno para el plan fiscal, según se presentan hoy, sino que también consideren el tremendo progreso que ha hecho esta administración a través de sacrificios y decisiones difíciles en los últimos 28 meses. Continuar este progreso requiere paciencia y valentía. Debemos darle tiempo a las medidas ya implementadas por el gobierno electo y no alarmar al, puerto, al pueblo de Puerto Rico, forzando prematuramente sacrificios adicionales sobre ellos. En su lugar, le invitamos a la Junta a unirse al gobierno para guiar a Puerto Rico hacia su recuperación económica. Y si con el tiempo las medidas adicionales recomendadas por la Junta se consideran necesarias, la Junta y el gobierno pueden trabajar juntos para atender mejor esta necesidad. En nombre del gobernador Rosselló, les aseguro a todos los residentes de nuestra isla que hemos trabajado incansablemente para presentar un plan fiscal que sea justo que equilibre los intereses de todas las partes interesadas, 
proteja a nuestros residentes más vulnerables y brinde la base para reconstruir a Puerto Rico y convertirla en la sociedad vibrante y próspera que todos merecemos. Señor Presidente y miembros de la Junta, en nombre del Gobierno de Puerto Rico, presento un plan fiscal revisado para su certificación, de acuerdo con los requisitos establecidos por la Ley de Promesa, el cual incluye las decisiones de política pública y los objetivos del Gobierno debidamente electo. Thank you, sir. Well, muchas gracias, señor secretario. If I may add just a comment is that uh, the Office of the CFO, we continue working with transparency and providing all the information that the board requires. I think that the, during the last month, I think Mr. Jarek can attest to that, we have been uh, very actively pursuing providing, uh, we, we just draft an MOU that we are, we are providing all the, all the data to the oversight board, and that is going to be uh, uh, the way we are going to handle our, our business. We would like to do. Thank you. Uh, question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate your your work and effort on behalf of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, uh, and we'll certainly uh, consider your your recommendations. I had a a question that, which is a follow up on the financial statements. Uh, I think it was a great achievement that we are finally able to do the 2016 financial statements. Could you give us an update on how you feel work will proceed now on the uh, 17 and 18 statements? Absolutely. What we are doing right now is uh, is like a different way of doing the audit. What we are doing is we are doing 2017 with one team, and we have another team doing 2018 at the same time on the on the areas that it can be done without closing the books of 2017. So we are trying to have to separate work streams on audit. It's, it's not easy, and it has not been done in other jurisdictions, but we talked to KPNG, and they are providing the resources, and the Office of the CFO also, also is providing new consultants so we can close the book in a more efficient way. And expect the end date? I know it's only an estimate at this moment, but... Yeah, uh, I know that on the last letter we, we include uh, 2017 in October and, 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 and the next one on March. What we are trying to do is trying to wrap both this year, during this calendar year. This calendar year? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anybody like to ask an additional question? Okay. I too would like to commend your work on behalf of the government of Puerto Rico. Thank you very much for your Thank testimony. you. Thank you. Now let's move on uh, to uh, uh, the proposed revisions to the certified uh, Commonwealth Fiscal Plan. And uh, I would like to welcome once again Mr. Resco uh, to give a presentation of the Board's review of the proposed revisions to the Fiscal Plan for the Commonwealth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Maldonado, for your presentation and for the cooperation. Uh, I'd like to reiterate again how much alignment there is on so many key areas of the Fiscal Plan. One of the most important mandates of PROMESA is the elaboration of fiscal plans for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and its instrumentalities to lay out a path for fiscal balance, a return to capital markets, and economic sustainability for the island's future. That said, the Oversight Board believes that the government's proposed plan, as submitted, is not in compliance with the requirements of PROMESA. Specifically, the plan does not meet several provisions of Section 201B of the law. And it is for this reason and in the best interest of the people of Puerto Rico that last night we published a draft version of the 2019 Fiscal Plan for the Commonwealth as developed by the Board and which we now propose for certification. This round of updates to the Fiscal Plan are, is, is primarily focused on updating the Fiscal Plan to align it to the fiscal year 2020 budget development process and to update for the most up-to-date factual information. As such, the overarching goals and outcomes of this fiscal plan all developed with the recognition that Puerto Rico is at a unique moment in its history. It remains constant. The 2019 fiscal plan maintains many of the core goals of the fiscal plans to date, but reflects actual implementation on the ground and focuses on managing fiscal priorities in times of constrained resources. The goals are to improve long-term growth through structural reforms that provide a foundation for economic growth, to improve the business environment for firms and entrepreneurs in Puerto Rico by improving Puerto Rico's place in the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index in critical factors such as getting electricity, construction permitting, property registration, and improving the ease of paying taxes. 
as well as digitization. To promote public safety in Puerto Rico by investing in the compensation of police officers and firefighters, as well as safety equipment and vehicles for the police and fire bureaus and chemicals for the Institute of Forensics. To improve educational outcomes for Puerto Rico's children, equipping them with key skills and improving academic proficiency across the board, resulting in an annual 12% reduction of the achievement gap on standardized exams. To improve the quality of health care while investing in preventive and tailored care by increasing the efficacy of the Puerto Rican health care sector and to enhance transparency through a focus on fiscal controls and reporting. Finally, to modernize and increase the resiliency of critical Puerto Rican infrastructure by maximizing the impact of federal disaster funding and long-term Commonwealth investments in capital expenditures. There are two major types of changes in the fiscal plan to October. First, there are changes for new data or information. This is reflected through macroeconomic changes due to updated disaster rollout, faster unwinding associated with the fiscal stimulus, and updates for major macroeconomic indicators. The fiscal plan continues to project that approximately $8 billion of disaster relief funding in total from both federal and private sources will be dispersed in the reconstruction effort, although the actual distribution of those funds is extended from 10 to 15 years in this plan and projected in a more level fashion based on actual disbursements and discussions with stakeholders. Population projections are updated based on new fertility and out-migration data as well as on the new macroeconomic projections. Baseline revenues and expenditures, including pensions, are also updated for new data. And finally, there are revisions to structural reforms based on implementation progress, as well as a perspective on what part of the surplus may not be available to the Commonwealth. Second, there are updates based on fiscal priorities, including funding provided for the police, teachers, firefighters, health agencies, and the Forensics Institute. Tantamount among these is a 30% increase in police salaries and required benefits, representing an increase of $11,500 per sworn police officer over two years. There are also additional capital expenditures and cost share funding provided to enable the island's reconstruction. Much of this spending was enabled via reducing spending in areas with low visibility or insufficient justification, as well as further reductions as compared to the October fiscal plan in professional services at the State Election Commission in the legislature's budget, further state insurance fund and automobile accident compensation administration measures, and the transfer of the Public Broadcasting Corporation to a nonprofit entity. Through the fiscal year 2020 budget process and fiscal plan implementation process, the Oversight Board has been able to bring increasing transparency to government actions and expenditures. <coughs> The 2019 fiscal plan aims to build on this progress through a number of mechanisms. First, the fiscal plan includes forecasts of gross revenues inclusive of the value of tax credits. The Oversight Board will require reporting on these moving forward, given the risk that tax credits could be uncontrolled. Moreover, the Board is explicitly urging the government to establish a cap on tax credits. Additionally, cash subsidies to business and industry going forward will be separately budgeted and transparent via the budget process. The fiscal plan continues to require separately the issuance of a tax a comprehensive tax expenditure report, which we've already worked with the secretary on and it's in progress. Second, the fiscal year 2020 budget included reductions in low visibility spend areas such as englobadas, marketing spend, professional services, and we had asked that the government justify with granularity all spending in these areas. The 2019 fiscal plan only includes spending where the areas were justified by the information provided by the government. Further, there will continue to be fiscal controls and reporting across cash balances, actual reporting, structural reforms and fiscal measures, macroeconomic indicators, recovery funding, PAYGO, and certifications required by PROMESA. Finally, the fiscal plan establishes that there will be ongoing public hearings held by the Oversight Board to highlight implementation progress and other on core topics. 
with regard to the structural reforms. The requirements regarding structural reform implementation in the 2019 fiscal plan remain the same as in October. However, scoring has been updated to reflect the government's ability to implement effective reform. The government has not adopted the immediate implementation of the NAP work requirement as outlined in the October certified fiscal plan, rather designing a pro plan for a four-year implementation. Therefore, the uptick in growth has been moved back four years. The government has failed to make notable progress to date on the reforms that move the needle within ease of doing business, namely process redesign within permitting, digitization to improve the ease of starting a business, and reduction of the burden in filing taxes. As such, the reform impact has been reduced and delayed in expectation of progress to come in the, in, in the next fiscal year. Finally, the transformation of PREPA has an updated timeline and the energy reform impact has been updated accordingly. The board saw the issues of public safety raised each and every day in the media. We met with the police unions. We heard their concerns. We monitored implementation across the Department of Public Safety throughout the year and we held a public hearing with representatives of the department to review successes, failures, and needs. In response, we've made spending on police a priority with the goal of improving the competitiveness of the compensation package and better outfitting the police force. We watched 700 sworn officers leave the force over the first seven months of the fiscal year, and we heard from the police about inadequate disability and life insurance policies. In order to reduce that attrition and improve recruitment ability, the following is reflected in the fiscal plan. Salaries and required benefits for sworn officers would increase by about 30% over two years, or roughly $5,750 per year, for a total run rate salary increment of $11,500 as of fiscal year 2021. An additional $250 per year employer contribution to life and disability insurance. The plan reflects Social Security for all police as of July 2019, which is the equivalent of $33 million per year. The plan reflects the second of the three installments planned to pay back pay to the police, $122 million in fiscal year 20. And it also reflects some $40 million in general fund capital expenditure allocations for bulletproof vests that were requ requested, radios, vehicles requested, as well as $2.5 million in special revenue fund capital expenses for hardware, and software. Of course, there are also other areas of priority spending that the government has brought our attention to. In health care, almost 50% of the island's population is dependent on Medicaid for health care, and health care agencies on the island are currently struggling to meet patient needs. Health care outcomes are not yet improving. In this light, the fiscal plan increased funding by $1.4 billion for Medicaid over fiscal years 2020 to 2024 to support the health care system. It also ensures that current nurse staffing levels can be maintained across the island, reversing any previously planned right-sizing in this category of employees. It invests in strategic health centers, such as $25 million for the Puerto Rico Cancer Center and $2.5 million for the Cardiovascular Center of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, two critical institutions on the island. It invests $12 million over two years, $6 million per year, for Medicare certification for the psychiatric hospital. It allocates capital expenditures for generators and increases capital expenditures from the special revenue funds for medical office equipment for the Department of Health. There's increased capital expenditures from the special revenue funds for air conditioning equipment for the Mental Health and Addiction Services Administration. And finally, there's increased capital expenditures of $2.1 million from the special revenue funds for generators and emergency room improvements requested and required by the Cardiovascular Center. In education, in a continued effort to support the governor's public education reform efforts and to improve educational outcomes on the island, the plan provides an additional $39 million beyond the $35 million committed in fiscal year 2019 for a UP City of Puerto Rico means tested scholarship fund that raises the amount from 2019 through 24 to 214 million dollars available, the equivalent of some five to seven thousand full tuition scholarships per year, so that no student who wishes to attend the University of Puerto Rico is barred from attending for financial reasons. 
It also provides a $500 salary increase for both teachers and school directors in fiscal year 20, following on the four on the $1,500 salary increase for teachers implemented this year by the government and $5,000 increase in director's salaries implemented by the government. That's a total of $14 million additional investment in the public education system. It also importantly eliminates the requirement for additional school closures, although the savings must be achieved via alternate measures. In other areas of public safety, the fiscal plan provides a $500 salary increase for all firefighters, in addition to providing almost $14 million in general fund capital expenditures for fire pumps, vans, trucks, again, the needs that were described at the public hearing, as well as almost $2 million in special revenue fund capital expenditures for enhanced equipment and materials. And finally, the fiscal plan provides an additional $4.5 million for personnel spending at the Forensic Science Institute to enable the hiring of the scientists, the pathologists, the examiners, the DNA specialists, as well as funds for non-personnel operational expenditures, laboratory equipment, and chemicals. The next slide <coughs> shows pre and post measures, own revenues, and own expenditures. Pre measures, own revenues, meaning not federal funds, drop 4%, while post measures, with the efforts that the government is making, own revenues are expected to be stable over this five-year period. Similarly, with, the, with our own expenditures, pre-measures, they're expected to increase by 3% without measures. But with the measures that the government will be taking, they will stabilize over the five-year period post-measures. Without these measures, revenues would drop much more quickly and expenditures would grow disproportionately. In fiscal year 2018, there was a significant decline in economic activity after the storms, followed by a bounce back that continues into fiscal year 2019. We've adjusted that decline to 4.7% to adjust for the actuals that were announced by the Puerto Rico Planning Board. Hmm. While forecasting the fiscal year 2019 real GNP growth rate now at 4%. So the 2019 fiscal plan reverses the negative pre-measures structural deficit by achieving a cumulative surplus of $13.7 billion by fiscal year 24. And the fiscal plan also projects a primary surplus through 2037, dependent, of course, on timely and successful implementation of substantial fiscal measures and the important structural reforms underway. This is before taking into account all contractual debt service, since only the restructured COFINA debt service is represented in these figures. However, the 2019 fiscal plan projects a primary deficit from 2038 through 2049 based on the unwinding of the fiscal stimulus from the federal disaster recovery and the lack of broader, deeper structural reforms that are necessary to change the underlying challenging economic and demographic trends in Puerto Rico. The 30-year cumulative surplus amounts to just under $20 billion. The 2019 fiscal plan financial projections show the, show the surplus generated by all entities covered by the Commonwealth fiscal plan. So it is important to note that some of this surplus is generated by Commonwealth public corporations and the Commonwealth's ability to access such surplus amounts could be at risk without further legislative action. In particular, the surplus generated by the State Insurance Fund Corporation, CIFIC, and the Cardiovascular Center Corporation of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean may be inaccessible. And as such, the 2019 fiscal plan also represents what the surplus would be should these funds be inaccessible. Full and timely implementation of the 2019 fiscal plan will put Puerto Rico on the path to meeting the objectives laid out in PROMESA, achieving fiscal responsibility and balance, regaining access to the capital markets, and restoring economic opportunity to the island. The best time to implement these reforms and to restructure the debt is now while Puerto Rico has the temporary benefits of federal disaster relief funding and a stay on debt service. Therefore, time is of the essence. We can make serious progress toward achieving the growth and opportunity that the people of Puerto Rico want and deserve, but it requires continued courage and hard work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Esco. Uh, let's move on to uh, public comment on the said proposed revisions to the certified Commonwealth fiscal plan. Let me open the floor for public comments. Each person uh, will have up to three minutes to express their view. 
Any person interested in a turn, please stand up once uh, we recognize you. We'll turn the microphone on on you and it will be taken to your seat. Uh, please state your full name and your affiliation, if you have one, and speak as clearly as possible. Would anybody like to make a public comment? Jose Luis? Welcome. Uh, yes, my name is Mariana Nogales Molinelli. I am hereby representing Junta de Mujeres. And I have uh, two or three questions, uh, if I may. I would like to know what are the essential services according to the Fiscal Control Board and according to uh, Natalie Jaresco. I would like to know how can a country emerge and develop without proper funding to education and the University of Puerto Rico. I would like to know the views of the Fiscal Control Board on uh, leyes de cabotaje. And uh, I would like to know the purpose of increasing the budget and the monies to the police of Puerto Rico, and if it has something to do with uh, a regime of uh, repression. Thank you. Okay, uh, Natalie, I'll let you take the first two. Um, I can answer the, uh, the third one is Leyes de Cabotaje is the Jones yeah. Act, right? And then the, the fourth, there's no, uh, the, the rationale behind the concept of uh, uh, dealing with the police uh, issue has nothing to do with uh, the premise of your question. It is related to the belief shared by the majority of people in Puerto Rico that without security, you really can't have economic development or anything. So uh, we've decided to, and the government has decided to move those issues forward. On the remaining issues, if you could please address the question. Yes, on the essential services uh, point, uh, we have not defined essential services because PROMESA itself sets forth a structure whereby we have to actually consider 14 factors when we come up with our uh, fiscal plan. Essential services is just one of those factors. What we have tried to do is to balance the 14 factors rather than just defining essential services and coming up with a strict uh, 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 nomenclature for that. I think it is in the benefit of the people of Puerto Rico, actually, not to define essential services, but rather to leave it as one of the factors that we must take into account. With regard to education in the University of Puerto Rico, I think everyone agrees they are absolutely critical to the economic development on the island, and that's why we're adding funding to it. That's why we've been supportive of the government's efforts to reform and improve educational outcomes in the public education sector. And that's why we've set up the means-tested scholarship funding for the University of Puerto Rico. But at the same time, it's not always how much you spend, it's how you spend it. So with regard to the University of Puerto Rico, there's no question that the fiscal plan, which we're not discussing today, but is, is in place, requires increased tuition, requires looking for other sources, third sources of revenues, whether that be from alumni, whether that be from federal grants, to differentiate and, and to, to diversify the sources of funding. But notwithstanding, there is sufficient money, as I described today, in this budget, in this fiscal plan, a $39 million fund for needs-tested students, equivalent of five or more thousand full-year tuitions, and that's in the fiscal plan going forward for the next five years. So the goal is to strengthen the University of Puerto Rico to ensure that it has the resources and the capacity to continue to be the jewel of this island that everyone believes it is. I think everyone shares that. And that it doesn't fall, uh, it doesn't fall in its, to a worse fate because it hasn't done the difficult work in reducing expenses, becoming efficient, and diversifying its revenues. Do we have anything to add regarding the uh, Jones Act? I would like, uh, before we address Jones Act, I mean, which sure. is, I think, a different issue, I would like to, to add to the, uh, to the executive director's response 
Your question was how, one of the questions was, how do we ensure an island can achieve economic development if we don't invest enough in areas like education, for example? The answer is, of course, we have to. I think that's what Natalie just answered, and we, and this fiscal plan definitely uh, provides for that. But the other part of the answer to development, to economic development, is that uh, we have achieved, is to note that we have achieved the level of economic development we achieved because we had access for 75, 80 years to the capital markets to borrow, to invest in the infrastructure of Puerto Rico, uh, to, the, to invest in the educational uh, system in Puerto Rico, to invest in the healthcare system of Puerto Rico. That was not built from current income in the annual budget. That was built on the basis of, of bond issues and borrowing in the capital markets. The reality is, uh, as we go forward, we have to reach a sustainable budget level that eventually allows the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico to return to the capital markets to be able to borrow money to invest in the future. No country will be able to achieve the levels of development we all want, the levels of development you're suggesting, merely by uh, uh, using available funds from current revenues in the budget. That would be definitely too, too painful and too uh, difficult to sustain. So remember the following. We have been out of the capital markets now for four years. Uh, we have sustained what we have uh, because of the very difficult, precarious situation we're in in a bankruptcy uh, setting. But long term, that is not sustainable. And long term, we have to be able to get audited financial statements, transparency in our financial reports, uh, a, a budget that is in, in equilibrium, and eventually access to the capital markets uh, to do all of that. So, so it's not just uh, wanting to invest. Uh, being able to invest requires, uh, hopefully, the achievement of the goals this financial oversight board has said for itself. With regard to the Jones Act, I just it's a, it's a congressional action that's required. We were supportive of the government's request yeah. for a, uh, since the long-term or full exemption doesn't seem to be on the Congress's agenda, we were supportive of a short, shorter term exemption for the transport of LNG, um, which I understand has not been provided. But again, it, it is not in the board's hands to make that decision. Thank you. Does anybody have any additional questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Chairman, regarding the question on essential services, we've addressed this also uh, with some members of the press and in other forums stating that essential services depends on the amount of resource, that how much, what you classify as essential depends on the amount of resources you have available to allocate. So in a context where you have a lot of resources, you can deem many things essential and you can, but it's not only the categories. Within each category there are actions, there's contracting, there's different things you allocate to. And what we've always stated is that essential services are defined on a budget by budget basis or on a fiscal plan by fiscal plan basis, depending on the amount of resources that are available for that allocation. And I think if we look at what's happened today, uh, we can see that what we indicated before actually works. Uh, I might not be happy with large parts of the fiscal plan, but what I can recognize is that in August of last year, we identified the need for additional resources in the police and in public safety. We had private and public debates that I'm sure were as frustrating to everybody on this table as it was for me. And the result of that is that we have reached a number of new, more resources for public safety. And the same in education, and the same in health. Areas that nobody in this room will doubt are essential services, right? So we have to recognize that the definition would be used by our opponents, opponents of Puerto Rico, to pigeonhole our work and not help us use the process to actually allocate resources where we need. <coughs> so I just wanted to add that to the comments. Thank you, Mr. Sobrino. Any additional comments? Would anybody else like to uh, uh, make a, a public comment or question? <clears throat> Good morning. Bienvenida. Good morning. My name is Yadira Carrasquillo, and I'm here representing uh, thousands, maybe millions of citizens here in, in Puerto Rico, United States, 
and international. The first thing about essential services and the definition that you have to define is that I don't think that you guys are, um, doesn't have the, the hurry enough that, that you don't have the compassion of thinking about our nation that is going down the drain for all the austerity measures that our government that does not represent, by the way, the majority of the people, and you guys doing these austerity measures. Um, so essential services should be defined completely and so we don't have any problems with that issue. So second thing is, there's nothing here that I could say that will help you guys <laughs> make any good um, choices or anything for our people. We know that you are not here for the benefit of the people. We, are, we know that you are here just for the benefit of the capitalism. Nah, you, we know your agenda. <coughs> We are not dumb. You think that because people are not here that we're not listening? We are. And actually, there is, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you so much for giving us, the Puerto Ricans here in the United States and international, the strength, the unity, the cojones to get together and the vaginas to get together against you guys. We know that you are lying. We probably here have some bonistas that have served the, the system before in government. And you, Ms. Jaresko, Mrs. Jaresko, we know what you did in Ukraine. You completely messed up that country. And we're not gonna let you do that over here. And we are working on coalitions and unions. And I want you to know that we are not gonna stop. You are not gonna take over our island. You are not gonna take over our system. We are gonna fight this until the end. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Would anybody like to uh, comment or answer any of the allegations made by the person? No? Okay, thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? Okay, let's move on then. So, um, Discussion and certification of the revised Commonwealth Fiscal Plan. Um, now, uh, I would like to ask any member of the board uh, who wishes to comment on the proposed fiscal plan uh, for the Commonwealth. Uh, on the basis of the presentation of the board's executive director on the proposed revised fiscal plan for the Commonwealth. Uh, sorry, uh, there's a mistake here. Does anybody have any comments regarding? I, I, I would just ask uh, our executive director to maybe expand a bit and highlight a bit the, uh, well, let me, let me uh, put it in context. Uh, you know, it's been almost three years since we started work. Uh, one of the critical problems uh, that Puerto Rico faced, one of the reasons we got to where we are, is really been historically a, an extraordinarily complex and convoluted public finance process and budgeting process with a marked lack of transparency uh, in the process, compounded in recent years by the lack of audited financial statements. I think we have made significant progress uh, in this direction, as uh, the Secretary of the Treasury alluded to, uh, uh, including the creation of the CFO office uh, and the uh, CFO and uh, slash secretaries work recently on getting financial statements. Uh, closer to, to being updated. But I'd like to ask our executive director to expand perhaps on, uh, in general, the measures we have requested and what we have achieved to enhance the transparency of the, uh, of the budgeting slash financial plan process in this, the third uh, iteration, the third year of that process. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. The, this fiscal plan reflects, I, I think, the greatest level of data sharing, uh, as reflected in the Secretary's earlier comments, and the greatest breadth of capturing all the activity of the government of all the fiscal plans previously. Uh, and an example that I'd like to give is that typically in Puerto Rico, the focus has always been on a general fund budget. 
because only the general fund budget is uh, reviewed and adopted by the legislature. But these fiscal plans include all the special revenue funds and federal funds. Again, in broad numbers, the general fund that you traditionally see is around eight, eight, eight to nine billion dollars of spending. But taken all together with the special revenue funds and federal funds, it's some 20 billion dollars. So it's an additional 12 billion dollars of spending that we now have visibility of and that we can now track and we can now look at how it's being spent. An example recently came up in the press with Centro Medico. When you look only at the general fund number for Centro Medico, you don't see how much is actually being provided because there are special revenue fund budgets for Centro Medico, and so you have to take it all. That is a big part of the transparency here. Above and beyond that, we've actually, with the help and support and collaboration of the government, gone into every single line item, revenues and expenditures, and gone through every set of assumptions in terms of both general fund and special revenue funds and all of the independent forecasted component units, all the public corporations that are in the Commonwealth. So we're now seeing everything across the board. We've recently, as the Secretary mentioned, entered into a memorandum of understanding to have full access, direct access to systems, six accounting systems, multiple payroll systems. That's very helpful as well and we're very grateful for being able to move forward on that. I think the publication of much of this data by the government is a definite progress over the three years in terms of transparency, from the bank accounts to the budget to actual reporting, and from that to hopefully improved attendance reporting and others. So I, I think if we add to that what is new to this fiscal plan in terms of reporting on tax credits, so in the past we reported net revenues, as of this fiscal plan you'll start to see gross revenues plus tax credits utilized so you'll be able to see in the system how, and in the reporting of the government how many tax credits were utilized in any reporting period, monthly or quarterly. And then you'll be able to, you'll be able to judge from that you know, how much is being spent on economic development in, on the island. That together with ensuring that all of the cash subsidies to business and industry are now reflected in the budget means you'll have a bigger picture as to what and how the government is choosing to use its, its resources to promote economic development. So I think, I think there's great progress over the three years, and I'm, again, very grateful to the government and Secretary um, for enabling some of this. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jaresco. And as somebody who has followed public finance in Puerto Rico for, for decades, I, I, I really must commend uh, you and your staff and the advisors to the board for the work and the achievements that we have uh, made over these three years. And, uh, and I also commend, as I said before, the, uh, the financial staff of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, uh, uh, because we're laying really the groundwork, the foundations, uh, to be able to have a more manageable uh, and sustainable process in the future for, uh, for public finance in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody like to make it? Okay, Dr. Biggs. Uh, I was hoping, uh, Ms. Dresco, you could give a little bit more detail on the changes made in the fiscal plan to assumptions regarding uh, structural reforms. Uh, these are often don't get much attention. I'm referring here to, to improving the ease of business, ease of doing business measures, looking at uh, the, uh, the welfare to work uh, element of the PON program to increase employment. These don't get very much attention in the short term, but I think they're very, very important over these long periods we're looking at. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the changes we made this year versus what was previously assumed. Yes, of course. The structural reforms are indeed what changes the structure of the economy and provides for much of the growth that's projected in the medium to long term. There are several categories of structural reforms. They remain the same from October's fiscal plan to this one. And if we take them one at a time, the human capital and welfare to work reform set, in that category, as you all recall, there were several parts of the reforms that needed to get done. One was implemented as of January 1st of this year, and that is the earned income tax credit, which is approximately $200 million available for working class residents uh, uh, in Puerto Rico to receive as a tax credit. We urge the government to promote this program, to make it widely known that it's available so that those who qualify are able to apply for the tax credit. It was supposed to work hand in hand, however, with a welfare to work program change 
that had to do with NAP with the food stamps. And in the fiscal plan from October, that welfare to work program was to be rolled out in one year. And you would have those two pieces working in the markets simultaneously. One, more people moving into the formal workplace through the welfare to work program. And the second, those in the workplace being incentivized to stay in the formal workplace through the EITC. And those two together were to create uh, economic growth. Given the, the government's uh, intentions to implement it over four years, we had to delay the economic growth that was expected in October coming in the next fiscal year out four years um, because you don't, get the, you don't get that stimulus effect until it actually is put in place. In the ease of doing business reforms, the government has successfully rolled out the Invest Puerto Rico and the DMO and the, you, you can read and you can see the activity that's being done with regard to rolling out those two parts of the ease of doing business structural reforms. However, in the uh, other areas of changing the permitting system, changing the registration of property, and reducing the burdensome nature of taxation, of the administration of the tax system, there's been less progress, although plans are underway. For example, in permitting, you've probably all seen uh, recent news that starting July 1st, a new permitting system will be in place. But to the extent that that hasn't been put in place yet, again, you can't expect economic growth until it's actually implemented. So if it's going to be implemented in the next fiscal year, the growth comes you know, afterwards, after those changes are felt by businesses in, in the workplace. So there haven't been changes in this fiscal year to move the dial on the specific, the specific business procedures, and that's why those um, scoring have been moved out and somewhat reduced because the implementation plans for the ease of doing business do not reflect um, perhaps as much as could be done with areas, for example, on registering property or the administration of, of, of taxation. In the area of getting low cost, affordable, reliable electricity, the scoring remains the same, but it's pushed out by one year simply because as we moved forward in this process, and as we mentioned earlier, the RFP is out on the street, as they say. Uh, very highly qualified proponents, bidders, are doing due diligence on the island for the concession agreement or the operation uh, management agreement for the transmission and grid system. All of that, that process is going to take a little bit longer, so that got moved out as well, but not reduced in terms of the effect that we expect. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to ask a question of Natalie as well. Um, <coughs> You've been speaking about specifics. Can you speak in general terms about how this fiscal plan compares to the October fiscal plan? Is it radically different, a little bit different? How, how do you see the two fiscal plans? Somewhere in between a little and radical. <laughs> um, it, it is a change, and if I were to describe the change in general terms, for the short period of the fiscal plan, the first five, six years through fiscal year 2024, the projected surplus goes down. Growth is lower over that five-year period. And that's because you've pushed out some of the reforms and because you have uh, pushed out as well some of the federal funding stimulus um, into the 10 to 15 years. So for the five-year, for the short term, uh, your surplus goes down uh, from in the October plan it was some uh, almost $18 billion. It is now just under $14 billion. So for the short period of time, for the five years, it, the surplus goes down, the growth goes down, and a lot of that has to do with um, the changes in the federal spending expectations or projections. Uh, the 30-year period, though, has a greater surplus. So the 30-year period, is now just under $20 billion surplus as compared to just under 13 in the October fiscal plan. And that, that has to do with a variety of things. I mean, you get a longer effect of growth because you now have 15 years of fiscal stimulus rather than 10. We're now showing the fiscal, federal funds coming over a longer period of time so that growth comes over a longer period of time. And some of the changes in actual data that we had reduced expenses going forward. So we had Medi Medicaid enrollment data that went down. The uh, government provided us updated data. 
that means that Medicaid expenses going forward are lower than we projected. Or we had updated population with both reduced fertility rates and, a, and, and the out-migration to date being lower. That means a lower population, lower expenses. So those things came together to provide for, uh, I'll call it a, a, a greater um, surplus over the 30 years. The third big picture that I would mention is that, and I don't have the actual um, years here, but the point at which the, the Commonwealth moves to deficit spending um, happens uh, earlier than in the October fiscal plan. And, and that, to me, is just a sign, again, of the need to accelerate or improve upon or add incremental structural reforms, um, because that means that over time, you know, the, the Puerto Rican economy is going to need additional measures to be able to manage in the long term. Thanks. Thank you. Any additional uh, questions or comments? Okay, on the basis of uh, the presentation by the Executive Director uh, on the proposed revised fiscal plans for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, uh, the Chair, I request from Ms. Charesco whether she would like to propose a resolution for the Board to consider and vote upon. Yes, Mr. Chair, I would like to propose a resolution and I'd like to ask Mr. El Curi to read the same into the record. Very good. Whereas on June 30, 2016, the Federal Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, PROMESA, was enacted, and whereas Section 101 of PROMESA created the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico, the board, and whereas Section 201 of PROMESA establishes a multi-step procedure for the development, review, and approval of, the, of a fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and whereas on April 19, 2018, pursuant to Section 201D2 of PROMESA, the board certified a fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico is developed by the board and issued a compliance certification to the governor and the legislature in connection therewith, pursuant to 201E2 of PROMESA. And whereas on May 30, 2018, June 29, 2018, and October 23, 2018, the, the board made certain revisions to set fiscal plan and certified revised fiscal plans for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And whereas subsequent to such certifications, the board has determined to make certain additional revisions to the revised fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and whereas by letter dated January 18, 2018, 2019, the board pursuant to Section 201A of PROMESA provided notice of the schedule for developing, submitting, and approving, and certifying a revised fiscal, fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, which schedule was subsequently revised to permit more time for the submission of the proposed fiscal plan, and whereas on March 10, 2019, the, government, the governor submitted a proposed fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico to the board, and whereas after reviewing the proposed plan with the governor's representatives and analyzing and deliberating over it with the board's members, economists, consultants, and attorneys, the board notified the governor on March 15, 2019, that the board had determined that, a, that the governor's proposed fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico did not satisfy PROMESA's requirements and the board recommended revisions. And whereas the board's notice to the governor described the violations that the board had identified. And whereas on March 27, 2019, the governor submitted to the board a proposed fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico attempting to address the identified violations in the prior proposed plan. And whereas representatives of the governor and the board's experts, consultants, and attorneys engaged in extensive discussions thereafter of the governor's proposed fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and the board's concerns about the plan resulting in the board developing a revised fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And whereas on May 9, 2019, the board held an open meeting to discuss the proposed fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and with, whereas the board provided an opportunity for public comment on the proposed fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and whereas after substantial deliberations, the board has determined to certify the fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico as developed by the board attached here to as Exhibit 1, for submission to the governor and the legislature, rep which represents the fiscal plan that the board has determined in its sole discretion pursuant to Section 201D2 of PROMESA, satisfies the requirements of PROMESA set forth in Section 201B thereof. Now, therefore, it is hereby resolved that the board certifies pursuant to Section 201E2 of PROMESA the fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, as developed by the board attached <coughs> here to as Exhibit 1, for submission to the governor and the legislature, which represents the fiscal plan that the board has determined in sole discretion 
pursuant to Section 201D2 of PROMESA satisfies the requirements of PROMESA set forth in Section 201B thereof, and which pursuant to Section 201E2 of PROMESA shall be deemed approved by the Governor. And it is further resolved that the Board shall issue a compliance certification for said plan to the Governor and the Legislature pursuant to Section 201E2 of PROMESA. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I will move that the uh, resolution uh, be approved. I would second the motion. Thank you. I'd like to ask for a voice vote. Those in favor, please say yes. 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 Okay. Uh, all members having uh, you voted in favor of the motion unanimously, the resolution is approved. Now, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, can I just make one correction? Yeah. In the Q and A, I said that the deficit occurs in this plan sooner. I meant later. And the, the rationale is the same. You have longer fiscal stimulus, and so the growth remains longer. And so the, the deficit in this plan comes in 2038 versus 2034 in the October plan, just for the record. I apologize. Thank you for the clarification. Let's move on. Uh, presentation of the proposed designation of municipalities as covered territorial instrumentalities and fiscal plan and budget submission by the Centro de Recaudación de Ingresos Municipales, CRIM, and certain municipalities. Having concluded uh, the, Commonwealth of, uh, of the Commonwealth Fiscal Plan Certification, I would like to move to our next topic on the agenda, which, within the context of uh, the overall economic and fiscal situation in Puerto Rico, uh, and in light of the fiscal plan we have just approved, uh, the members of the Oversight Board have also been considering the financial situation of the island's <clears throat> 78 municipalities. To those effects, the Board has had several meetings with mayors from both the Federation uh, and the Association of Mayors, Federación y la Asociación, members of the governing boards uh, and executive staff of El Crim uh, and various professional organizations from the private sector. In order to better understand the challenges and opportunities facing our municipalities um, that they face on a daily basis, I would like to now ask and invite uh, our executive director to give a presentation on where we are on such efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> to provide some additional context, uh, just would like to underline that the Oversight Board is committed to ensuring the adequate funding of services for the people of Puerto Rico. And many important services, as made evident in the aftermath of Hurricanes Irma and Maria, are provided at the municipality level. The fiscal situation of the Commonwealth, however, has led the government and the Oversight Board to agree to phase out municipal subsidies as a measure to prioritize much needed general fund funding. And in the past two years, the Oversight Board has been working to better understand the fiscal situation at the municipality level by holding several meetings with mayors, CRIM officials, and other stakeholders. It is clear that a combination of property tax, which is a, a key revenue, and fiscal responsibility measures for the municipalities are needed. The Oversight Board's goal is to work with the CRIM in order to implement, promote, and track revenue enhancement measures and to improve the agency's financial performance by increasing property tax revenues to better support municipal governments. There are several revenue measures that can be achieved at the administrative level and are not targeted at increasing property taxes. By working together to improve CRIM's performance, the government of Puerto Rico will be in a better position to eliminate other tax burdens, such as the inventory tax, which hinders business and economic development. Therefore, we are proposing to move forward and have the island's 78 municipalities declared covered territorial instrumentalities under PROMESA 101D1A, subject to the requirements therein. Furthermore, the Oversight Board will launch a pilot initiative requiring fiscal plans and budgets from 10 of the 78 municipalities. And the 10 selected municipalities are Aibonito, Barranquitas, Camuy, Sidra, Comerio, Isabella, Orocovis, Quebradillas, San Sebastián, and Villalba. Consistent with the overall goal of financial stability for municipalities, we also propose that CRIM, which is a covered territorial instrumentality since September of 2016, be required to submit a fiscal plan and a budget for certification. Of great significance in our analysis were factors such as one, the change in Puerto Rico's demographics. Two, the gradual elimination of the tax equalization fund incorporated into the Commonwealth's fiscal plan. Three, the municipality's responsibility 
with the resident's health care services through their payment obligation to assess and with their retirees under the PAYGO scheme, both in compliance with local legislation and four, the continued and uninterrupted provision of services by the municipalities to their residents, amongst others. If you turn to the next slide, we understand that incorporating the municipalities in CRIM under the provisions of PROMESA and helping them develop and work with tools such as certified fiscal plans and compliant budgets can only result in the adoption of improved financial and budgetary practices by municipalities in CRIM, increased transparency and accountability in the management of municipal finances and budgets, a boost in the economic development strategies at the local level, enhancement of intermunicipal collaboration, an increase in property tax revenues to support municipal functions and responsibilities, insurance that there are continued and uninterrupted services by the municipalities to their residents, and that all of the foregoing will achieve fiscally responsible and sustainable local units of government. As to the practical implementation of this initiative, on the next slide, you will see we've decided to commence with the above mentioned group of 10 municipalities, therein including towns led by mayors of both political parties, for which we will request that the governor of Puerto Rico submit fiscal plans to the oversight board pursuant to the provisions of section 201 of PROMESA. These towns were not chosen because of any insolvency or discussion of administration. They were chosen because they have worked together previously. They are co-located and could potentially share services and because they all had fiscal challenges. To facilitate the process of developing the fiscal plans and budgets and in recognition of the autonomy of the municipalities, the board intends to work directly with the municipalities during this process. The guiding principles for the fiscal plans of the 10 municipalities include requirements to, one, adopt best financial, budgetary, and economic development practices and structures to achieve fiscal responsibility. Two, implement measures to reduce spending, enhance local revenue collection. Three, promote and enhance municipal cooperation structures, such as shared services arrangements. Four, improve procurement and management of grants from the federal government, from different non-government organizations and then ensure operational efficiencies. Additionally, for CRIM, the Oversight Board will look to make sure the public corporation is at a minimum taking steps to increase the number of registered properties, correct properties classification as needed, increase the collections rate, which is currently some 68% and target a collections rate of 85%, reduce the number of exemptions and exclusions, and increase the number of hired appraisers. Going back to the municipalities that were selected, we evaluated several data sources to determine the, the, the 10 municipalities that will be required to produce fiscal plans. It, again, it, it included their dependency on the municipal fund transfers from the central government, their financial position, unpaid PAYGO liabilities, OBRE scores, other financial and operating metrics, as well as, again, their geographic co-location. Here you see the timeline that we set out for the production of fiscal plans at the 10 municipalities in CRIM. And we believe this timeline is achievable if we all work diligently to produce them for the Oversight Board's consideration. Mr. Chair, this is the proposal for the Board's consideration. Thank you, Mr. Esco. On the basis of the presentation by the Board's uh, Executive Director on the proposed designation of the uh, municipalities of Puerto Rico as covered territorial instrumentalities under the law, the chair requests from Mr. Esco whether she would like to propose a resolution for the board to consider and vote upon. Yes, Mr. Chair, I would, and I'd like to request Mr. El Kuri to read the same into the record. Whereas on June 30, 2016, the Federal Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, PROMESA, was enacted, and whereas Section 101 of PROMESA created the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico, and whereas Section 101 D1A of PROMESA provides that the board in its sole discretion may designate any territorial instrumentality as a covered territorial instrumentality that is subject to the requirements of PROMESA. And whereas Section 519 of PROMESA provides that the term territorial instrumentality means, among others, any political subdivision, subdivision of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And whereas attached here to as Exhibit 2 is a list of the 78 municipalities that comprise the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and which the board desires to designate as covered in territorial instrumentalities subject to the requirement of PROMESA, 
and where Section 101 D1E of PROMESA provides that the Board, in its sole discretion, may designate a covered territorial instrumentality to be the <coughs> subject of an instrumentality fiscal plan, as such term is defined in PROMESA, separate from the fiscal plan for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and require the Governor, governor to develop such instrumentality fiscal plan. And two, such covered territorial instrumentality shall also submit a separate instrumentality budget, as such term is defined in PROMESA. And whereas attached here to as exhibit two is a list of 10 municipalities that the board desires to designate as subject to a separate instrumentality fiscal plan, and as to each of which the governor shall develop such fiscal plan and a separate instrumentality budget shall be submitted. And whereas the board desires to designate the Centro de Recaudación de Ingresos Municipales CRIM, which was previously designated as a covered territorial instrumentality, uh, which designation is hereby ratified as subject to a separate instrumentality fiscal plan and as to which one the governor shall develop such fiscal plan and to a separate instrumentality budget shall be submitted. Now therefore it is hereby resolved that the board designates pursuant to section 101 D1A of PROMESA each of the 78 municipalities listed in exhibit two attached here to as a covered territorial instrumentality subject to the requirements of PROMESA and it is further resolved that the board designates pursuant to section 101 D1E of PROMESA each of the 10 municipalities listed in Exhibit 3 attached here to a subject to a separate instrumentality fiscal plan and for which a separate instrumentality budget shall be submitted all in accordance with such notice as the board shall deliver to the governor pursuant to sections 201 and 202 of PROMESA setting forth the schedule for developing, submitting, approving and certifying said fiscal plans and budget. And it is further resolved that the board designates pursuant to section 101 D1E of PROMESA, the Centro de Recaudación de Ingresos Municipalities, CRIM, as subject to a separate instrumentality fiscal plan and for which a separate instrumentality budget shall be submitted, all in accordance with such notice as the board shall deliver to the governor pursuant to sections 201 and 202 of PROMESA, setting forth the schedule for developing, submitting, approving, and certifying said fiscal plan and budget. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, Judge. I move that the resolution be approved. I second the motion. I'd like to ask for a, uh, a, a voice vote. Those in favor, please say yes. 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 All members having voted in favor of the motion, the resolution is approved and has passed unanimously. Uh, since we have no uh, other matters to cover, I move that we adjourn uh, this meeting. I second the motion. Then I'd like to ask for a voice vote. Those in favor say yes. 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 Okay, all members having voted in favor, the meeting is adjourned at uh, 10.55, well, 10.58. Thank you very much. Seguimos. Comenzamos la conferencia de prensa. Preguntas. No, pero... Danica. Yes, good morning. Danica with the Associated Press. Um, could you tell me a little bit about, you know, details on your decision to um, bring the 78 municipalities under PROMESA? You know, what concerns do you have specifically for all of these municipalities in addition to the 10 that were chosen? And do you expect um, that pilot program to cover additional municipalities in the future? There were no particular individual concerns with regard to any of the 10. I need to be very, very clear. This is a pilot, and we, we're, not, we're not certain the weather will continue. What we'd like to do is take this pilot and listen to the mayors, work with the mayors, work with the stakeholders to see whether or not we can assist and support the municipalities in the very difficult work they have to do, notwithstanding the fact that the Commonwealth subsidies uh, to the municipalities are reduced over time. And so this is not a specific set of problems, and before we take on any additional we're going to see how it works with the first 10. Um, but part of the question also dealt with overall, if you could give me you know, your assessment of how municipalities are doing. It varies municipality by municipality because demographic challenges are very different. Economic development within, comparing San Juan and Ponce to Isabella and uh, Comerillo are, you know, it's impossible. So I don't, I don't think that there is a general theme. Um, I think for, for, for all of us, uh, what we're doing is respecting and recognizing the value of the municipalities and the hard work that they have ahead of them. 
I just, I just wanted to add that uh, I think the general premise of your question with regards to how they're doing, we all know that you know the municipalities are facing uh, challenges it's, uh, as in Puerto Rico. The purpose, as stated by the executive director, is uh, the pilot program is to assist those municipalities. We will be providing them uh, with resources. Uh, we want to make the process as collaborative uh, as possible. We want to help them uh, with the way forward, uh, and I think that's very important. Uh, we don't view this as a uh, as a uh, an action that uh, should be viewed negatively. We want to assist them moving forward, and uh, they were chosen, uh, as was stated, uh, based on geographical proximity, uh, amongst other factors. Um, and as was pointed out, uh, no one was signaled out. Uh, simply, there's. There's members of both parties that administer, uh, and that was uh, the overriding theme was in general similarities and geographical uh, proximity. Um, hello, my question is about the disaster funding totals. In your notice of violation, you advise the government to revise the proposed plan to reflect the full amount of fund that FEMA reports. Uh, I want to know how you decided the, the final amount that you would include in the plan about what would be received from, from FEMA and what are the considerations? Sure. We use the same numbers that you saw in the October fiscal plan. No update was made. Uh, we've had d discussions with FEMA, discussions with Core 3 here, discussions with the government. There was no change to FEMA's um, short-term projections and no particular change to the government's uh, longer-term projections. Valentin. Yes. Uh, first of all, can we can we have a timeline for for these budgets and fiscal plans to be submitted by municipalities? Is it going to take place before uh, the beginning of the next fiscal year this summer, or it's a longer period? And I want to ask about Title Three for some of these municipalities. Has that been in consideration among board members? Title III was not uh, something that we looked at or that had anything to do with the decision to cover the 78 uh, municipalities. And I believe that the deadline for the fiscal plan is prior to the beginning of the fiscal year. But I'm, I don't believe that the deadline for the budgets will be able to be fit in given, given the date today of this decision. It'll come slow, sometime after uh, the beginning of the new fiscal year. Primera hora. Yes, uh, uh, one question regarding this uh, new measure again uh, with the municipalities. Uh, would you expect, uh, this is uh, opposition from the mayors, uh, this is kind of a takeover the municipalities, and if, because you said the proximity is one of the key aspects you took into consideration with this pilot, is this in advance to you actually consolidate the municipalities, you're projecting, reducing the numbers of municipalities with this? Uh, plane. This is absolutely not a takeover of anything. It's a collaboration. It's an effort to collaborate with the mayors. Um, we believe uh, in the municipalities. We've stated, and uh, as every resident of Puerto Rico that lived through Maria understands, the mayors were essential, um, and they are the governing body closest to the people. We are uh, seeking to work with them and to assist them. As to what that entails going forward, whether they'll be, uh, we'll see. Um, that has to be a part of the process um, that we want to engage them in, uh, shared services or other uh, concepts. Uh, but we're not going into this with a, a definition of what we think. Uh, we're there to assist on the fiscal matter and to help them elaborate their own way forward. Kevin. There's no discussion of changing the law with regard to municipal, municipal autonomy. Kevin, what we are. Uh, Chairman Garion, you had mentioned that the decision to designate the 78 municipalities was made after discussions with mayors and uh, private sector organizations and CRIM. I, I may have just missed it, but did those discussions include the Commonwealth? Well, we had uh, engaged the, uh, the government um, regarding the municipal issue. Um, as you know, the governor has a, a, a plan uh, which um, has not been forthcoming to us, but uh, this isn't uh, a situation that should be viewed as in opposition to what the government is pushing forward. 
Um, this is an issue uh, and an effort to work with the municipalities um, and to find a way forward. Um, that's the way uh, we're going about this. Joining Saber and Rubia. Buenos días. La encuesta del Nuevo Día denota que la población que antes le daba el soporte a esta Junta Fiscal ya no le ve de esa forma, ya considera que ustedes no están haciendo su labor. Quisiera que por favor ofrecieran una reacción a ello. Y también, si es posible, que nos puedan dar un poquito más de detalles de este proceso que se haría para trabajar con eh, las acciones radicadas contra terceros y el tema de los de los suplidores, ¿qué específicamente están considerando en este proceso? ¿Es mediación o, o qué cosa se haría? Claro. Mire, eh, el resultado de la, de la encuesta, eh, nosotros eh, respetamos eh, cómo se siente el pueblo de Puerto Rico. Eh, el único comentario que le haría es que eh, este proceso, este tema, no se debería filtrar del sobre el crisol político eh, tradicional. Esto es un proceso de bancarrota y las bancarrotas este, desafortunadamente eh, son difíciles eh, y se toman decisiones eh, antipáticas eh, y por lo tanto pues eh, nos encontramos envueltos en ese proceso. Eh, en cuanto al segundo, eh, la segunda pregunta suya, este, le, digo, le diré que eh, aunque el proceso de la manera que fluyó, y aquí tenemos el, el abogado, eh, que le va a explicar en castellano la situación, este, el procedimiento y la razón por qué eh, nosotros eh, se estableció un comité eh, compuesto de cuatro personas. Este, eh, yo no participé en ese comité, ni tampoco el señor González ni el, ni este, ni el señor García. Los cuatro miembros del comité elaboraron una, una posición eh, y elaboraron, este, la, tomaron una determinación y tomaron estas acciones. Eh, Jaime, tú pudieses elaborar un poco sobre sí. el proceso, por favor. Arthur, with your permission, I'm going to speak in Spanish about the uh, process for the vendor claims. Um, efectivamente, la idea es que respecto a la resolución de, de los temas con los, uh, con los contratistas que fueron sujetos de demanda, es uno tratar de uh, hacer el proceso, como dijo el el juez González, lo más eficiente y menos costoso posible. Por lo tanto, sí estamos entreteniendo la posibilidad de hacerlo a través de mediación, más todavía estamos tratando de hacer un proceso que sea informal, donde se le dé tiempo, se le va a pedir al tribunal que extiendan los plazos para contestar las demandas, para así darle la, 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 la más posible comodidad a, a las personas que están sujetas a estas demandas, que puedan presentar la información necesaria eh, y que sea un proceso informal, que no tengan que incurrir en gastos innecesarios. Así que estamos considerando todas esas opciones para otra vez hacer el proceso lo más eficiente y menos costoso posible. Periódico Metro. Sí, buen día. Queremos saber si cuándo tendrán un calendario específico sobre la implementación de este plan piloto y si existe la posibilidad de que se añadan más municipios sobre la marcha. Bueno, el, 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 the timeline we have is just... The timeline was up on, on the screen. I think June 7th is the first submission of the fiscal plans and then we move from there uh, in a collaborative fashion to try and complete them before June 30th and the budget would follow so that the budget then would be uh, compliant with that fiscal plan as we've done in the past. In, in terms of a plan for additional municipalities, we have none at this point. We are going to work with these 10 and uh, move forward as appropriate after that. Noticel. Yeah, uh, regarding the decision about the municipalities, I'm way back here. Uh, <laughs> does the decision represent a lack of trust on the government's projections and or a way to continue to decentralize the government's practices? And does it also mean uh, a long-term projection to consolidate uh, municipalities? None of the above. Um, it is just what we described it to be and nothing more. It is not an intent to to consolidate anything, it's to work with these 10 to show that there are methods to increase revenue collections, there are methods to reduce costs while continuing to serve the people in the municipalities, and that this can be done with a little extra effort, and we're willing to put our resources, some technical assistance, 
on the table to work with the municipalities as an example, and hopefully this pilot project will inspire other municipalities, um, but no, it's none of the above that you described. Nancy. Sí, buenas tardes. Eh, tengo dos preguntitas. La primera es, la administración de los sistemas de retiro estaba supuesto a cerrar una vez la liquidaran los activos. Y si ya sus activos fueron liquidados porque la agencia sigue en función. Y la segunda pregunta es, ¿cuál sería el plan en cuanto a las pensiones a los pensionados? Um, the first question, Jaime, I'm not... Sure, I, th I think the, the, of ERS. the question is, uh, uh, since is the ERS assets were, liqui uh, were uh, liquidated, yeah. why is ERS still in existence? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry? I, yeah. I got the question. The question okay. is the answer. Uh, the answer is. I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, the I'm, answer, the question answer right is. Now for the government because I don't know yeah. what the liquidation plan and timing is of ERS, but the ERS is still an entity under Title III yes. going through a bankruptcy process, so I don't believe that it can be liquidated until. The whole process is complete. Exactly. I'm not. I'm not a lawyer. That's it. That's exactly certainly right. until you have a a carryover trustee to handle the administrative chores of paying pensions and managing the uh, the data. So I assume that's still in the works. But uh, that's a, that's an issue for the government really to address. Yeah. And the question on pension policy, the pension policy reflected in the October fiscal plan is the same as the one in the previous fiscal plan, which is a policy. Given the requirements of bankruptcy and the fact that retirees are unsecured creditors in the eyes of the court, and you can only have so much different treatment of different creditors, the, the board took an approach to reduce the cost of pensions on average 10%, but no one with a pension at or below the federal poverty level would have any reduction whatsoever. And that same policy, no change, is reflected in this fiscal plan as it was in the October fiscal plan. Well, me sugieren que repita lo que dije de administración de sistema de retiro en español. Simple y sencillamente, el hecho que se liquidan los activos de la empresa no significa que las funciones administrativas de la agencia eh, desaparecen. O sea, hay que mantener los records de servicio de los empleados, los récords de pago de las pensiones, los procesos de pago, etcétera, y hasta que se designe o se identifique o se, se cree una eh, organización alterna para llevar a cabo esas funciones, pues tiene que continuar. Así que esa decisión organizativa de parte de, del gobierno de cómo se llevarían a cabo esas funciones en el futuro, eh, pues no está tomada, definida todavía, pero mientras tanto no se puede dejar caer el balón simplemente cuando hay que está la data eh, de los participantes en, lo, en el sistema de retiro. Walter, Telemundo. Sí, buenos días. Yo quería ver si me podían repetir el, el criterio que se utilizó para incluir a estos 10 municipios específicamente eh, dentro de la asignación especial que hicieron y cuál es el threshold de, de, po de pobreza eh, para esos pensionados que no se les estaría tocando eh, la pensión. So on the second question, what the federal poverty threshold is, Andrew, if I recall, it was $1,000, but that changes each year. So depending on when the pension policy is implemented through the plan of adjustment, that would be updated based on the federal poverty level. In terms of how we chose the, the, the municipalities, we, we looked at you know, fiscal vulnerability of all the different municipalities. We looked at who was more reliant on the subsidies that the Commonwealth is eliminating over the fiscal plan period. We looked at the other revenue streams that these municipalities have. We looked at the experience that they have working together. Many of these are already working together, already developing shared services. So they are, let's say, um, willing and able and, and you know, making those, those efforts. They're co-located. We talked about this geographically. If you're going to share services, it's easier to do so if you're co-located one next to another. And yes, we looked for some balance in the political uh, leadership of the municipalities. Spanish version, uh, can anyone? They're este, not translated? Se tomó, yeah, se tomó en consideración, sí. se tomó en consideración eh, geografía. Este, eh, también que hayan trabajado juntos, o sea, el concepto de servicios este, eh, combinados. Se tomó en consideración eh, cuánto de los presupuestos municipales eh, este, depende del gobierno central. Eh, esos tres factores principales y un balance político para que no se pu 
pudiese manifestar que estábamos pendientes de uno que otro. Este, creo que son seis eh, del Partido Nuevo y cuatro del, 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 del Partido Popular. I believe we have mainland media on the, on the line. Any questions? Noticias. Buenas tardes. En abril el gobernador anunció que no se reduciría la aportación eh, patronal para el plan médico. Esto al menos para las agencias gubernamentales. Si esto es, ustedes lo tienen, eh, ya lo sabían, lo tienen como parte del plan fiscal que certificaron. Y por otro lado, se espera que también el Ejecutivo firme en los próximos días un proyecto que exime a los alcaldes a que aporten a ACES y también a lo que había mencionado de, del sistema de retiro a través del PIGO. Eh, sobre el segundo tema, eh, no, o sea, hemos visto eh, preliminarmente el, el, lo que se está planificando. Le puedo manifestar que eso sería, esa legislación sería inconsistente con el plan fiscal y con el presupuesto. Sobre el tema primero, este, estamos en conversaciones con el gobierno sobre ese tema. Se planifica una cantidad uniforme a través de todas las agencias de gobierno eh, para plan médico. Cyber News. Eh, Ustedes entienden dado el hecho de que pues ya va, eh, sería la, la nuevamente las discrepancias entre lo que presenta el gobierno y lo que present, lo que ustedes aprueban con enmienda, ustedes entienden que en efecto van a haber un nuevo incumplimiento de parte del gobierno en los renglones en que ellos ya definitivamente indicaron que no van a estar cumpliendo con esas parte de, de, del plan fiscal y si en efecto en algún momento van a tomar una medida concreta para que puedan hacer el cumplimiento. Eh, entendemos que eh, esperemos trabajar en conjunto y esperemos que se cumpla con la ley. Si en la medida de que hay unas discrepancias o eh, pues se atenderán, hay un proceso establecido en la ley, proceso 203, eh, o este, procesos legales, eh, pero no, no, no nos estamos anticipando a ese tema. Serimal, Noticentro. Buenas. Um, I also need answers in Spanish, I'm sorry. Eh, con relación precisamente a lo que comentaba Alex, eh, el gobierno el año pasado ya retó las instrucciones o lo, o lo que decía el plan fiscal en términos de bonos de Navidad, por ejemplo. Si ese escenario se repite, porque están ustedes otra vez incluyendo el asunto de la eliminación del bono de Navidad, el recorte en las pensiones, y, ese, y el gobierno vuelve y reta las intenciones de la Junta y del plan fiscal, ¿cómo reaccionan ustedes? ¿O, ¿O sería un asunto de esperar cómo cuadra el presupuesto a fin de año si en efecto se producen los eh, ingresos adicionales que ellos han proyectado, etcétera? Ok. Eh. Why don't you, yo lo, tradu, yo lo, yo lo traduzco, why don't you ex explain uh, for the benefit of everybody the difference between last year's budget and this year's budget regarding specifically the issue of the Christmas bonus? So as we described earlier, we, we've been able to get much more detailed data and much more detailed, more transparency about the numbers in the budget. And what that means is last year, the budget had personnel and non-personnel spending. And within that personnel spending, you could have more people leave and pay the Christmas bonus. All of those funds, whether it was salary or benefits or Christmas bonus, it was all in one line. The budget going forward is much more detailed and it has salaries, it has health care, it has Christmas bonus, And if it says Christmas bonus zero, then that will be overspending in line with PROMESA section 203, which says if there's overspending, there's a process that we go through. We communicate that overspending. The government is required to find some savings somewhere else, in other words, to cover that spending. If they do not, again, if you look at section 203, in the end, the board, if nothing is fixed by the government, the board can actually go in and reduce other lines of the budget for that overspending. And that would be the same in any category. It's not unique to the Christmas bonus. But in any line item where there's overspending, and because the lines are now much more detailed, you would go through that process and say, you've reported you've spent too much. 
which we just recently did, you probably noticed, with the Office of Human Resources. They overspent their budget, so we sent the letter saying you overspent. How are you going to fix the overspending? And if you don't fix it under Section 203, there's a process where the board then goes in and reduces something else in the budget for that overspending. And that would be the same whether it's the Christmas bonus or the health care per employee or something else. Okay. Uh, pues este, este es un proceso. Eh, cada año eh, uno entiende mejor el presupuesto de Puerto Rico, que es extremadamente complejo. Eh, y eh, el año pasado, para simplificarlo, utilizar términos no específicos, pero eh, para que se pueda entender mejor, podría mirar el gasto eh, de la nómina como un gasto englobado. Eh, lo que está manifestando la directora ejecutiva es que eh, este año va a haber partidas definidas en el presupuesto específicamente en cuanto a ese renglón. En ese, en ese renglón va a haber que se prohíbe el pago del bono de Navidad. Eh, no tan solo no se presupuesta, sino se prohíbe. Eh, el mismo, si se paga, este, eh, tendrá, empezará el proceso, como señaló la directora, un proceso 203, que es un proceso establecido en la ley, eh, donde entramos en una conversación con el gobierno de, mire, pues este, se gastó aquí de más, eh, ¿cómo vamos a reemplazar este dinero? Eh, y ellos eh, tratarán o buscarán la, la, lo, los fondos y si no, pues este, al final del día la ley eh, nos permite a nosotros sacar esa partida de algún otro renglón. Muchas gracias. Perdona un momentito, déjame esta arañapa, de último. Buenas tardes, tenía una pregunta adicional con respecto a los municipios. Una, ¿qué, qué ustedes definen específicamente con recursos que se le van a asignar? Y dos, eh, dice el refrán popular que como que cuando alguien abarca mucho o poco aprieta. Ustedes todavía no han recibido decenas de planes de implementación de las agencias de gobierno. Hay infinidad de asuntos eh, de disciplina fiscal que todavía no logran a, arreglar al nivel del gobierno central. Eh, ¿No es quizás ambicioso tocar a la puerta también de los municipios? Sí, es ambicioso. Eh, este, estamos en un proceso para tratar de, de atender temas que no se han atendido por muchos años y no le tenemos miedo al reto. Eh, yo, yo añadiría lo siguiente, o sea, eh, seguro que es ambicioso, todo esto es ambicioso, eh, pero es necesario, o sea, la, lo que ha sucedido a nivel del gobierno central, las tendencias demográficas, el ciclo económico prolongado negativo que hemos tenido en Puerto Rico, le ha puesto unas presiones extraordinarias a los municipios. Sabemos que los municipios han tenido dificultad en adaptarse a esas presiones. Podemos ignorar lo que está pasando porque eh, podría decir que no está maduro, eh, pero entonces estoy seguro que dentro de un año estarían preguntándonos por qué no nos movimos antes para atender la crisis de los municipios, qué estaba pasando, eh, qué estábamos haciendo mientras ocurría todo esto, etc. Si es que esto es un intento de comenzar a trazar un camino para que los municipios tengan unas, eh, unos procedimientos, unos protocolos, una disciplina para em empezar a adaptarse a las necesidades de planes fiscales eh, que les ayuden a evitar llegar a una situación crítica. Eso es lo que estamos tratando de hacer. Les aseguro que si no empezamos a tener una conversación con ellos, ciertamente las tendencias son claras, van a tener eh, situaciones difíciles, críticas eh, que atender en el futuro. Entonces la pregunta será, como dije antes, ¿dónde estábamos? ¿Por qué no tomamos, eh, los atendimos antes? ¿Por qué no nos enfocamos? Claro que es ambicioso. Claro que es más trabajo, claro que, que no es fácil, pero ¿cuál es la alternativa? Ignorarlo sabiendo que viene la, este, la corriente eh, adversa eh, eh, de camino, ¿no? La primera parte de la pregunta, ¿cuál era? Perdona, que creo que, que no la contesté. Que, ella, que preguntó resources. qué significa recursos. Este, yeah, yo no entendí esa pregunta. No sé, Natalie, si understood it's, that it's, first. Sí, que ya... 
a recursos de nosotros. De la, de la, what, what do you yes, mean by uh, our resources to help them? Yeah. It's, it's our team, our advisors, and, and we're working with a variety of mainland organizations, foundations that also support. We'd like to bring them and bring what they're capable of doing to the municipalities and increase the, 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 the number of sources of support that can be provided to municipalities. Aside expertise. from expertise, aside from uh, what, what's already known. No, it's not financial. It's technical assistance. We will stay within our budget. Eh, uno, el compañero de ti no había levantado la mano y no había visto. Me disculpa, esto es lo último ya. Bien, buenos días. Tengo dos preguntas. Me gustaría que en concreto se explicara cuán extenso va a ser el término para establecer el presupuesto para ciencia forense, de cara, obviamente, considerando el ataponamiento de cadáveres. Y la segunda pregunta, eh, si bien es cierto, se había informado que la Junta había solicitado un aumento de presupuesto también para su funcionamiento. Eh, tengo entendido que se informó la directora Yaresco, había dicho que había un aumento de 25 empleados para implantar todas las necesidades de este plan fiscal. ¿Cuánto sería el costo para el pueblo de Puerto Rico de este aumento de empleados? En cuanto a tu segunda pregunta, el, la, los gastos de la Junta están, son públicos y están en el, en el website este, de la Junta. Eh, se va a conservar y se va a permanecer dentro del presupuesto que ya ha sido este, publicado y discutido en múltiples ocasiones. Eh, todos los empleados que ella, se referí, que ella se refirió estaban contemplados en el presupuesto establecido. No significaría que va a haber un incremento o pedido de incremento en ese presupuesto. En cuanto al tema, el detalle de, de ciencia forense, eh, tú tienes el, you have the, the, the details of the, eh, ella va por ellos y si tú quieres que te los traduzca, con muchísimo gusto. It's the, the question is what are we providing for forensic yeah, what, science? What's, what's in the, what's a, uh, what resources, additional resources it, are being Additional provided? resources are four, resources. financial four resources. and a half million dollars for payroll. Uh, the Forensic Science Institute asked during this year to hire some more people, but that was not part of the plan going forward. It was an, an exception. Now we've added that to the, to the plan for the next year so they can maintain the level of the hiring that they need to do for scientists, pathologists, examiners, and DNA specialists. And in addition to personnel, four and a half million dollars, there's $700,000 in additional non-personnel. That's laboratory equipment, chemicals, the things they need to do the work that they do. Muchas gracias. Estamos. Gracias. gracias. Eran 4.5 million en... ¿En personal? Sí, en 700. 700 en non-personal. Eh, son 4.5 4 en gastos adicionales y 700 mil en, no en gastos no personal. Over, over what period of time? No, pues no, francamente no recuerdo el, 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 how much time? It's just over the, over the fiscal it, year. It, 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 it's not just a one year and it goes away. It's consistent going forward. Yeah. Estamos. Gracias. Algo adicional? Okay, muchas gracias. Gracias.